Okay. Good morning, Lord Young. Good morning to you. It's a real honour to have this opportunity opportunity to interview you. Thank you so much for agreeing. And um, first of all, how are you and Lady Young keeping? We're self-isolating and enjoying ourselves, frankly, because the weather's been beautiful, spring weather. But I'd be quite happy to get back to work at some time. A bit of a second honeymoon. Enjoy. <laughs> Well, we, we celebrated our 64th anniversary down here. Yes, I know, on the 18th of March. That's it, yes. yes. Happy anniversary. And you got yes. married in Hampstead Garden Suburb, Synagogue. Hampstead Garden Suburb, yes, that's right, yes. Quite Fantastic. a while ago now, quite a while ago. Yeah. Do you remember which minister married you? Oh, gosh, it, it's gone just for the moment. It will come <laughs> back to me before we finish. Now, tell me something. When did you join... Rabbi Landy, Rabbi Landy. Rabbi Landy. Great man, great man. Tell me, when did you join St. John's Wood Synagogue? Oh, that's thanks to my grandchildren. I was a member of Great Portland Street, uh, but Bernard, whom you know, my son-in-law Bernard and my daughter Karen, um, lived in St. John's Wood, and oh. I resisted coming over until the grandchildren came. And then, of course, I joined them for the on table, and that was it. And I well, they should give you a lot of nachas. They're all very lovely. Um, so we, we love seeing you in St. John's Woods, and we, we see you there on the High Holy Days and occasionally other times. Tell me something, how important is faith to you and how has that perhaps influenced your life and, and your Jewish identity and, and uh, your involvement in the Jewish community? Well, I, I, I am very much Jewish, a Jew. Um, and in, it has been the cornerstone of my life, although I'm not particularly observant. Uh, and it, it, in a very different way. In fact, let, let me explain. My father um, was born in a village called Yurovich, uh, 20 kilometers from Minsk. And he grew up there, um, he was born in 1900, and he lived there with two siblings, his parents and grandparents, in two rooms, and they had a black cow. And they left there in 1905 and came to, to, to London, driven out by pogroms. <clears throat> uh, and my father and our large family, because he had many more brothers and sisters before the end, uh, grew up in London. And I grew up in Stamford Hill. My, my parents married. My mother uh, was born in the UK, but her parents came from the borders of Germany and Poland. Um, and we grew up in Stamford Hill. Um, Stuart and I, I had one brother, Stuart, my younger brother. He was the head of the BBC at one point, right? Well, by, by, as I say, my father came here in 1905 as an immigrant, and before he passed away, Stuart was chairman of the BBC, and I was in the cabinet. So it, it's a big change <laughs> in, in one generation. Wow. Uh, but we were evacuated in, in the war. We lived, came back in time for the Brits, so we grew up all, all the way in the war. We're very much part of the war generation, and uh, uh, occasionally when people talk to me about health and safety, <clears throat> I do bore them with the story how I went to Christ College Finchley, my school with many of, it was 60, 70 percent Jewish in those days, uh, during the Doodlebugs, we'd be having lessons, we'd hear them overhead. If one of them stopped, the teacher would say, down boys, we got under the desk, it went bang, we got up and carried on. And, and that just shows you what a different world it was and what a different world it is. But, but I'm digressing. I grew up in a Jewish household um, and young people in those days, the only place they met were in charity committees. There were, there were no coffee bars, there was a, a club perhaps at the, uh, uh, the shul, and that was the only, only thing there really was. And in fact, I, I was chairman of something called the Charities Aid Committee, um, a youth JNF in those days, it was JNF um, uh, committee, where I met my wife and, and we got married subsequently after that. But it, it was um, a, a very different world. Uh, I tell the story sometimes of, um, my, my children couldn't believe this particular story. I wanted to be a film director. Uh, I, 
And when I was 16, I left school at 16. When I was 16, I had a, uh, uh, an appointment so I could become an apprentice to a film director with the union. It got cancelled. So when I came home from school that day, Dad said to me, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. He said, you become a solicitor and your brother will become an accountant. We both said, yes, Dad, and we did. I promise you my children did not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you had a really fascinating career. I mean, an enthralling career, both, both in the business world, in the, in the political world. As you said, you qualified as a solicitor in 1955, I believe. And um, in your early career, you worked with Sir Isaac Wolfson. And I want to find out a little well, bit about what that was like. Yeah, I, um, uh, when I qualified as a solicitor, I hated law. So hated the practice of law. So I was offered a job, oddly enough, at my wedding reception, I was offered a job in great universal stores. And I joined there, like my wife wanted to marry a good professional person and she ended up marrying a businessman. They were, you can never tell. And what is more, I was a businessman by the time I came back from the honeymoon, so it didn't last very long. Um, I worked in GUS and after a while I became IW's PA. And I would be in the office at 7.15 in the morning at a time when few people got in early. Wow. Uh, and I spent five years, he was a wonderful human being, generous, warm. Um, I, I sat with him one afternoon when he rang every one of his nieces and nephews and said to them, I've given you too many shares, I want half back for the foundation. Wow. And they put the vast bulk of their wealth, I think 95% of their wealth, into charitable foundations. My, my father was actually in school with his nephew, and they were the most impressive people. We, we spent a Shabbat with them. Yes. Um, yes. An incredible family. What, 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 you know, looking back at that time of your life, what are your fondest memories? Of, of, of IW. Well, he, he, he treated me uh, as his son. Um, it, it, it was a wonderful relationship. I mean, I was newly married. I'd, I, I'd tell you a typical day with him. I'd be in the office at just after seven. Uh, he'd be in at 7.15. We would go nonstop until two o'clock when he would go back to his flat in Portland Place for sleep. I'd, and I'd spend the next two hours catching up with all the things he wanted me to do. I'd be there at four o'clock in the afternoon and about eight o'clock, uh, Edith, his wife, Edith, who was a wonderful human being, said to me, that would say, Isaac, Isaac, David's got a wife, send him home. And he'd let me go home. So I, it was a very intensive life in which I gained enormously in wow. what I learned here. Yeah. Incredible. And, and, and what I saw really in operation is philanthropy in operation. I mean, sure. he, wherever he went. Um, I, I will tell you a, a quick story of this. After the, uh, uh, the, the war, the oil price rise, the, um, the, the, the beginning of the 60s and war, the Arabs started to put in the boycott. And Shell uh, had to divest itself of Shell, Shell the Shell refinery uh, and the Shell chemicals. And I went out to negotiate and we bought all three and that was the origin of Paz in Israel. We bought them all for one pound hmm. because they had to sell them and Isaac put it into a charitable foundation and that's the Wolfson Foundation. Wow. And Israel was a sleepy agrarian economy where the latest technology was avocados. They were just coming in. Uh, and uh, I was told there, look, we don't need cars in Israel. He said, we're a small country. We, we can walk everywhere. Well, within a few years, that was shown to be nonsense. Yes. Yes. There's highly qualified traffic jams in the Western world. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the that's amazing. I mean, during the 60s, you also, you, I mean, you built up various businesses and companies in, in industrial property. Well, in, um, eventually, after five years in G GUS, I no longer was working for Isaac. I decided I didn't like being employed. Uh, and I started up a business. The, in those days, the motorways were just being built. 
and the passage of goods around the UK was moving from rail to road. Uh, and I started building distribution centers at all the junctions of the uh, motorways. Uh, and in fact, it was fascinating. You could draw a map of the UK by time. And as a motorway w went up, the country got shallower and shallower. And when the M4 opened to Bristol, it literally halved the time from four and a quarter hours to two hours to drive from London to Bristol. Mm. And, and that was a big revolution. Anyway, I... But, but tell me something, when you look back at that period of your life, yeah. when you were in the business world, first of all, what would you say was your greatest achievement? And if you were starting out again, what would you do now? Well, I, of course, I kept on starting. But my, my greatest achievement, frankly, was survival. Because, uh, you know, I, this was an age when there were no startups. The, the, not many. In fact, when I'd go out in the evening, I wouldn't tell people that I worked for myself because the ethos in those days was profit was theft, that if you made money, somebody lost money. Mm -hmm. And, and it, I, it was a bizarre atmosphere which ended up with the terrible decade of the 70s. Anyway, I built up a, a business in, in distribution centers, but also construction, civil engineering, a, a group, which I sold out to town and city properties and went on the board. And then, um, which is the story of most people's business life, along comes the great big property crash. Uh, and I, I went back to go uh, without collecting the 200 or whatever it is in Monopoly, uh, and uh, effectively had to start again. And it was a time when every one of my friends was broke. Um, the, uh, uh, but it, it, it all broke, nobody knows the difference. We, we all enjoyed it. Mm. And um, I entered into a joint venture with manufacturers, Hanover doing property lending. And, but at the same time when I'd been doing all of this, I was very much involved in community life in the UK, in the charitable. I became chairman of British Ort, at that time, um, uh, I'd do ought. And then along came the week that changed my life. The director general of ought at World Ought in that time was a man called Max Browdy, who was chaplain of the forces, he was a rabbi, with the, came over with the American army and was the first person in, in three different camps. And what he saw there changed his life. And he stayed in Europe. The camps became DP camps, displaced person camps. And he ended up a few years later becoming director general of the World Ort Union. And at that time, I had a very luxurious office in, in Brook Street over the manufacturers had of a building there. And he rang me up one day and he said to me, David, he said, you're not that important, you can't afford to take a week off. Come with me to Israel for a week. So two weeks later, we fly to Israel, we stay at the uh, Hilton, Tel Aviv. Quarter to six every morning, we left. <clears throat> and we drove round every single art school. We'd come back eight, nine o'clock at night. I'd be exhausted, he'd still be carrying on. And we did that for a whole week. And we came back and that week changed my life. I saw at first hand how vocational education transforms young people. Academic education fails 80% of the population. But anything that, that's vocational, anything that's technical, seems to transform and, and turns young people from majoring in truancy to actually becoming enthusiastic. Absolutely. Anyway, as it went on, I met Keith Joseph, who ought, he was a guest. I went to see him. I started working for him because this was the terrible decade of the 70s. Strike ridden. IMF had to come. We were broke. We, the, the country was in turmoil. And I agreed with Keith that if and when they won the uh, 79 election, I would take a two-year holiday give up. I was building up a joint venture with uh, manufacturers. However, I cashed in my chips and I'd take two years 
um, working with him to help actually have them start privatization. Well, I'd only been there a few weeks when officials came to me and because they knew I'd been an entrepreneur, they told me that for the past 20 years, there have been more closures than startups in, in firms for 20 consecutive years. Mm. And the number of companies in the country had gone down to three quarters of a million. Gosh. And I started the first of the schemes to help small firms to get funding, the very first of the schemes um, to help people working for themselves. Now, as it happened towards the end of the 70s, I'd been taking shadow ministers, <coughs> conservative ministers, I was to see the old schools because I really wanted them to get into this. And Norman Tebbit was one of the people I took there at that, that time. He was also a minister in the industry department with me. And uh, one day um, I was called to a meeting with Keith Joseph and Norman Tebbit, and the subject was who will be the next chairman of the Manpower Services Commission. And on the way home, I thought, well, why don't I? <laughs> and so I put my hat in the ring. I became chairman of the MSC. Wow. In those days, youth unemployment was the critical problem. Imagine this. On the 1st of September every year, over 400,000 16-year-olds went on the unemployment register and went from getting 50p pocket money to 15 pounds from the state. It Gosh. was it was terrible. So we, I created something called the Youth Training Scheme, which helped young people, all of them, into employers before Christmas and for the next few years. And the big battle I spent my time was to get unemployment down. Well, I had come across Margaret Thatcher a few times and had meetings at Number Ten. I'd seen her, uh, and as the big political problem of those days was unemployment, and I was in the heart of it, I would see her quite a lot. Then uh, one day, my time was nearly up as chairman of the Manpower Services Commission, and um, I had a, a meeting with her, and as a result of that, she asked me to come in the cabinet and take responsibility for employment employment programs incredible so, incredible so, so in, so, in 1984 just for our for our listeners to understand in 1984 you were created a life pair uh with the well, title of baron young of grafham and then you were part of, of of margaret thatcher's cabinet holding various positions both as secretary of state for employment and later secretary of state for trade and industry so could you tell us a little bit about that chapter well, in your life? I, I i went in the cabinet because in order to go in the cabinet, you've got to be a member of parliament. And as I had never stood for election, because nobody would ever let me, I think once the golf committee, <laughs> but that's another matter. Um, I, I, I entered the Lords. Uh, and so we, 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 we worked I took one year as minister without portfolio. The next year, she asked me to become employment secretary. The 87 election came on. She asked me to to run that. I ran the election effectively uh, from central office. We won with over a hundred majority. Then she asked me to come to trade and industry. And uh, I, I spent five, uh, five years in as a politician, as a minister, five years as a official, as a manpower services. And uh, when I we privatized the last of the industries in uh, uh, DTI, as it then was, which was a great department of state in those days. One day I, I went to her and I said, Prime Minister, uh, I've, I've got a Jewish wife. I've been a volunteer for 10 years. I've got to go back to work. And uh, she understood. And so I stood down after 10 years. But I spent the entire decade of the 80s. Uh, as, as a volunteer. Uh, in wow. Uh, and it was 10 fairly fulfilling years. Um, and, and when, when I, uh, and then um, I became chairman of uh, Cable and Wireless, which was one of the executive chairman of Cable and Wireless for five years, which was one of the big international telecom companies. 
But at the same time, and, and this is much more important in my book, I became the first president of Jewish Care. Wow. We put together the blind and everything. We put, we, we put, in my seven years as president, we put 11 different Jewish organizations, communal organizations together to form wow. the foundation of, 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 of Jewish Care, which, which was really. And at the same time, uh, I became um, president of the World Orc Union. So I was now responsible for, for the whole of your port. And I must tell you the one theme that runs through my life, I get an enormous number of very interesting jobs. But if I charged five pounds for any one of them, I wouldn't have had a job at all. As long as they were voluntary, I got the job. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah, tell me I, something. Um, it, I mean, I was very fortunate because, um, and, and it goes back to my father who brought Stuart and I up saying, whatever you do, you've got to give back. And I think I spent the whole, whole of my life, um, always a third of my time, at least, if not 100%, which it was for many years, doing work in, in the community or in the wider community, because it was not. Sure. Anyway, those, um, this carried on. Um, Jewish Care built up to the great organization. I'm, Thankful I did it because one of these days I may have to go there. So it, <laughs> I'm 88, it's getting closer. So, uh, and we, I, I was also <clears throat> president of the Institute of Directors. And I had a number of other, uh, other things I would do around the case. Tell, tell then, me something, tell me something. Uh, just, just before we talk a little bit about your Jewish care and other Jewish charities you're involved with, just before we move on from the 80s, Margaret Thatcher. What was your relationship like with her? Did you have a close relationship? Yeah, I had a very close relationship. She, she was a wonderful woman. She, um, she, she was Judenfall. She thought, she, she thought the, the Jews were, were, yes. I was part of a cabinet at one time that had five Jews out of 21. There wasn't one today. There wasn't one before, maybe one or two. Left off. I, I, I was a part of a cabinet that had five Jews in it at one time. And she thought and believed, and she wasn't too wrong, the Jews were self-started, self-starters. There were people. And, and remember, all of us were not that many generations away from immigrants. Who oh. always are more so. But, and yet, having said that, you never saw anybody in the 80s in the city wearing a yarmulke. Mm. You never ever, when Hanukkah came, lit the lights, candles, anywhere, anywhere. For the last 20 years, I'm fed up to the IT of the singing Moat, so uh, uh, in, in the Speaker's House of the Commons, the Speaker's House in the Lords, in number 10, wherever you go, your lights are <laughs> I think there's a grave danger of another fire of London. But, but uh, <laughs> no one minister, one to a, a UJA or, or, or um, uh, dinner. Today, we, 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 we get, they're, 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 every dinner has a minister of some sort. Sure. And CST, which I'm part of and have been for the last, last few years, I, I chair the public affairs committee of the board, um, uh, we, we always have a prime minister or home secretary come to the dinner. And the community Incredible. as a community um, is, is highly regarded. You know, I'm going to say one thing, this is a bit romantic and it's a slight exaggeration, but I am the first in my direct paternal line for 100 generations to be born like anybody else since the destruction of the Second Temple. Now, it only by me, it's by accident, because my father was born in Belarus, or Lithuania as it was then, but I am the first that when I was born, I was not inhibited from doing anything. And for all those generations, our people have been pent up, limited. When the Enlightenment came in uh, 1840s, Within 20 years, we had the leading philosophers, the leading mathematicians, the leading medical people. 
and why for all these generations we what have we done we studied Talmud we studied Gomorrah we've used our intellect at a time when the rest of the world frankly the vast majority could not even read and write sure. and that comes through and that is a reason I believe why our people have done so well once they have the opportunity to do well tell me something do you have you know i'm sure your grandchildren will be watching this i'm sure many young professionals and youth members of our community will be watching this interview do you have any closing advice or message to the younger generation who are starting out perhaps in much more challenging times uh in terms of this whole situation we're living through right now what would be your closing message to them oh well first of all um two, two things <clears throat> one is the best bit of advice I could give them. I regard myself as wise today, but my definition of wisdom is the memory of past mistakes. And the older you get, the more mistakes you get. As long as you remember them, the wiser you get. If you forget them, you end up anyway. And, and the second thing is, everybody has it within themselves, the ability to do what they want if they just focus and do it enough. Life is a great glorious adventure. You can do all sorts of things. You just have to believe in yourself and really work. We worked very hard when I was young, still work hard today. Uh, we did not have um, work-life balance. That concept didn't exist. So I'm afraid in this world, you, you take out of it what you put in and it's, the rest is up to you. Incredible. Lord Young, this has been an absolute pleasure. You know, I'm thinking of the Talmud in Kedushin. The Talmud says, which means before somebody who is wise, you stand up. And the discussion in the Talmud is what defines wisdom? Is it seniority in age or seniority in knowledge? And I think you tick both boxes in terms of your incredible knowledge and incredible life experience. I personally have learned so much from this few minutes with you and I'm so grateful to you. And I wish you and your wife only good health. And I look forward to seeing you in the synagogue very soon. Okay, thank you, and I do. Stay safe. God bless. Bye.